I'm going to kind of start this out with a mindset of why why a lot of things become such a struggle in today's troubleshooting. And, and troubleshooting today is not the same that it was 10 years ago, genuinely. Systems, especially commercial systems, but even beyond commercial, there, this has hit uh, you, like residential type systems between what we're dealing with, with uh, VRVs and mini splits and even just regular split systems of today is we're, we have a different style of, of troubleshooting where before, you know, you used to have a regular ladder diagram and you used to have a regular um, uh, uh, pictorials type setups, right? And then we would uh, just, you'd see everything in series. You know, if your high pressure switch was tied in with your low pressure switch, which ran through those safeties to get to your contactor. That's not the case anymore. And especially the, 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 the more time goes by, the less we're gonna see that stuff anymore. There may be some safeties ran in series, but the vast majority of systems are moving to a IO uh, design. And, and what's driving that is that we're moving into a deeper like control boards, you know, a, a more automated system. And so uh, that's what that means as a IO is, is specifically IO is input and output. And it's a, it's even, it's a very, it's a heavy automation term. And, and what these manufacturers are doing is they're building like automation level controls into the factory controls of that equipment. And so in many cases where used to the automation company might come in and build out a control structure for that unit and run that unit directly from that, uh, now we're getting more to a point where honestly, a lot of the automation systems, unless it's just an air handler in the mechanical room and it has no control system, which even those are starting to get them, uh, they, they may be writing just maybe a set point and a, and a stop start, you know, turn off, turn on. And those, uh, that, that, that may be as simple as, it, as it's getting. Even their, their static loops and their static controls, even something like those things are starting to become uh, uh, proprietary to the manufacturer. Uh, a prime example of this is like in telepax and uh, carrier large commercial RTUs, like a 50N series, right? All of, that, all of those controls are built into the, the unit. The only thing the automation is doing is reading what the unit says it's reading. It's just pulling points via a communication bus. And then it's writing to it, hey, please run a supplier temperature of 55. And oh, by the way, would you also turn on while you're at it? And maybe I'd like a static of one inch. That's about it. I mean, th there are other things the automation can do, but a lot of them, that's really all they have to do anymore. Uh, now, this is not a blanket statement across the board, but in a lot of applications, and the further down the road we go in this, it's going to become this way. Uh, another prime example is, uh, especially mini splits and VRVs, uh, specifically VRV systems have central controllers from the manufacturer. Like LG uses AC Smart, and uh, Daikin has what they call the touch manager. And these are central control systems that tie in and communicate with all the other units in the building to where they don't even need an automation company to come in and do anything. It's all, it, technically it's all mechanical. It's all on our shoulders as the mechanical contractor. There is no automation company to call. The schedule, the communication, everything is built into that, that manager that they put on the wall in some random closet. So this is our future. And this is where the industry is going. This is why classes like this are extremely critical because the days of series controls are quickly fading. All right, I just, I, I wanna make that point clear as we go into this. Because honestly, genuinely, most of your trade schools, even today, still teach an, a traditional series parallel control structure. And they're not wrong for doing so. Those are the fundamentals. You need to learn that stuff. But the more advanced we go, and the residential side is just as impacted by this as the, as the heavy commercial, 
the, 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 you're not going to see that. So uh, anyway, that being said, a heavy focus of this class is going to be towards that direction of that's where every, I see people day in and day out, they, you get hung up on these control boards and you look in the unit and you see something that looks exactly like that and what you're looking at is every single one of these is either a sensor or a safety. Your high pressure switch is one output or a technically input. Your low pressure switch is another input and each circuit will have its own high pressure and low pressure. And it, it goes, it, it continues down that list. And now you're also having to deal with temperature sensors, you know, that are reading everything and you've got to be able to take ohms on that sensor and verify whether it's reading accurately or not based off of a conversion chart, right? Most all this stuff is things that you, you would usually only ever run into on a basic level if you were an automation tech. You know, I'm, and I say that, and we're talking like 20 years ago, over the last 20 years is when this has really become more prevalent. In the last 10 years, it has escalated even more. And that's the cycle we're seeing, is just manufacturers are doing this. Why? Efficiency and control. That's what it boils down to. They're being required to make everything more efficient and by to get more efficient, they've got to gain more control. And this is how they guarantee that they can achieve that. Because they've, they have to hit like e, those EPA standards and the SEER ratings and all those other requirements. And then some states have even stricter requirements than the, the, the national requirements, right? Uh, I think California is a, is a prime example of that where uh, we can do things here in Texas that they're not allowed to in California. And it's strictly because of the regulations they have. You know, they're trying to push more efficient stuff. So just keep that in mind and remember that mindset. Uh, any, any questions up to that point or kind of trailing from that thought? I don't want to run too, too fast through that. That's, that's a, that's, this is a, it's, it's a complete mental change of the troubleshooting process. You know, it used to be as simple as you could walk up and, you know, <laughs> say there was no control board at all. It was just, uh, say we had a split system in the panel and you had your contactor and you just had a coil and you would have a Y wire come in and it would land, and then it would come right back out to um, uh, the common. And that was it. It turned the contactor on. And then technically it got a little more advanced. So, so then we started tying in. You had a high pressure. Technically it's a normally closed. Then you had a low pressure. And that may have been it. High pressure, low pressure. Either of those trip, unit shuts down. Nowadays, you turn around, you look at, you know, a, a modern condenser getting put in. Uh, most of them will have their own 24, not always. Usually if it's like a heat pump, it will have a 24 input externally. But if it's a non-heat pump, typically they'll have a transformer inside the, uh, the control cabinet that the uh, L1 and L2 are pulling into, let's just, we're using a single phase example, and then you've got your contactor, I'm gonna put this over here. Come on, Holden. You can draw this, don't worry. Everybody's waiting. And so off of this, you will have your control board, and there'll be a little circuit board in there, and you'll have one output, Two wires is high pressure. One output, two wires is low pressure. You may have a uh, um, OAT, outdoor air temp sensor for outdoor air lockout safety. Um, and then, you know, uh, um, you, <laughs> in some cases, so it used to, as things progressed, you might have had a, uh, a discharge temperature limit. 
So this should be your high pressure, low pressure, and then discharge temp. So if the discharge temperature on the compressor got too hot, it would open, kill contact. Well, again, that's gonna be another output on this board. Um, so this is where it's going. Now, not all of them will look like this. One of the things they have done as a transition in some of them you may have one output leaving the board that has all the safeties, okay? So it, it may not be individuals on something like this regular uh, um, uh, split system. And, and IntelliPaks kind of follow that cycle, where in IntelliPak, all the high pressure controls will be on one safety output or input, and the low pressure controls will be on a, on a different one. And so you will see that sometimes. But on those IntelliPaks, for example, it'll say a, a high pressure or compressor failure or something like that. It may not specify high pressure. It may, I think they say circuit failures or something along those lines. That could mean the compressor temperature overheated. That could mean the, um, and that's the winding temperature. Those have internal uh, uh, safeties on the windings. That could mean a high pressure. That could mean, uh, let's see, there, there's three specific. Temperature, pressure, there's one more. Mm, I'm blanking on it. It's not discharge, temp. Anyway, like you, you have multiple safeties ran. So that would be, it, you could still see that on something like this split system. These three sensors could still be ran in series, but again, the difference is it's not ran in series with the coil. This coil will have a separate output just to control it. Why would it have outputs on high pressure or the inputs? So technically, like a high pressure safety would be considered a, an input, okay. right? Um, I'm trying to decide how deep I want to go into that now versus later. So anyway, this is just kind of a picture of, of where we're at as an industry. And this is what's changing. Uh, as, as, as systems grow and develop, this one being a prime example, we can look at the controls uh, everybody online, I'm sorry, uh, do not have the ability for y'all to see this, so just do your best to follow along. Some of the things that these systems are doing is they are no longer using high and low pressure safeties. There's not a physical switch anymore. And I'm, actually, I'm, I'm really glad that came up because I, I didn't think about that ahead of time. Uh, so, yeah, there is no switch. There's no switch to read across and say, is this open or closed? It is quite literally the transducer. So it's taking, and that's, that's what this panel is doing. That's why I can't find it on the schematic, because this panel is actually using the transducer pressures, whether it be the low pressure transducer or the high pressure transducer, as the safety, which leads to why, we, one, we need to be able to troubleshoot those uh, and, and verify that they're accurate to begin with. So, and it's really not complicated to do it. It's just a little intimidating. And genuinely, you would, you would troubleshoot a, um, you would troubleshoot a pressure transducer very similarly to how you would troubleshoot an actuator. It's a very similar process. You still have three wires. You have a power, a signal, and a, um, a, a common, right? One difference between an actuator, which we'll talk about as well, and a transducer is the actuator is receiving a signal that transducer is transmitting. So that's where a transducer becomes an input device, where an actuator would be an output device, right? Uh, and those are some of the variations. I mean, th these are the things that we'll have to start cycling into. And, you know, another example of that is we've got split systems out there that have ECM motors in them now, as for the condenser fans. All that goes back to efficiency and low ambient control. So instead of, uh, like, you can't even just ohm out the motor 
like you would normally ohm. You and test it like you would normally test any. You know, it's not a PSC, a permanent split capacitor motor anymore. You know, and they just those are those little things that we're cycling over to. You know, if you don't have a Zebra uh, ECM tester, I highly recommend you look at investing into one. They're about a hundred bucks, I think. Or last time I looked at at it, they were. You know, those are those are types of tools that are going to become your common fan power boxes, and uh, are, are another example of where there's a lot of them going in. that are going to have ECM motors, and even some of them, they'll have a motor speed control, and that motor speed control it, it's not like a traditional motor speed control, right? So your traditional motor speed speed you go to like uh, the the control supply house and pick up. It's just a potentiometer. It's varying a set of resistance that you could literally read uh, to control that motor speed. And all it's doing is adding resistance to the winding to slow the motor down. And you turn the resistance down to speed the motor up. Well, uh, in ECMs, it's, uh, you, when you turn on that control board, there's nothing to really measure. What you're doing is you're adjusting an output algorithm that's sending a signal to that ECM via communication telling it how much to speed up or slow down. Like there, there's nothing there to measure. That's our new reality. And th that's an extremely effective tool. There may be other ones out there, uh, genuinely, I'm not, that I'm not aware of. I know Zebra has been one that's been around for a long time. They've got a lot of trusted products. And it's definitely one I know that I could recommend. I've used them in the past. I don't currently own one. Uh, but I have used them uh, before with really good results because, you know, and, and there's a couple of different levels to like that Zebra one. So I do recommend, you know, trying to save up and invest in the little higher end uh, versions that they have because some of the lower ones, one, don't fit as many motors and two, they, um, uh, they may not test like the actual power side. So some of the higher end Zebra testers that you can actually plug in. Because those ECMs, you have two plugs. You have your communication plug and a power plug. And, and again, don't think in your mind that you can just test across that power plug. Because it's not the case. That plug goes and provides power into the ECM COM module, which is literally just a little micro VFD. And then from there, it, it uh, outputs a, in a separate plug inside to the actual motor. So testing across that, you know, the, the plug for the power to an ECM is not going to give you the winding resistance. You've got to break that, that module completely down, and some of them you can't. But the ones that you can, you've got to completely break it down to actually get to the motor winding plug. One of the things that you can, uh, you can expect is like the higher end equipment, we'll use chillers as an example. Typically, we will start to see controls and, and different types of, of improvements in systems in equipment like chillers, probably roughly 10, 10 years or so, the early versions of them, before they ever actually trickle down to lower end equipment, a split system would be considered in that category. Right? Uh, so an example I'm going to give you now, we've got a uh, train has as their, their uh, air-cooled chillers are coming out now with uh, analog inputs for their condenser fan control. So we've got three phase power coming in and landing for, to feed power to it, but then it has a separate uh, uh, um, control, wire, b control bus that comes in and it's actually feeding a DC signal like it would give an actuator telling that fan what, what speed to run. Like those are things we're having to troubleshoot now on like the chiller side. And it's just a matter of time before those start to cycle down into RTUs. You know, uh, that's where uh, the, the carrier RTUs are a prime example. They, they still use motor masters, which are little, literal micro VFDs. It's just a matter of time before those become obsolete and it's all contained there in the, in the motor itself to where the control panel is just sending a DC output and the motor is through its own internal logic board, taking that output and converting that to a speed. Yeah? 
I'm just, I pause there on purpose. I want that to kind of sink in. Like it's, this, this, is, this is here. And uh, uh, most of your, um, most of your VRVs will have, they're not actually true ECM motors on like your VRV setups. They're a, uh, I'm trying to think how to even explain it. It's been a minute since I've actually changed one, so I'm trying to remember too. Uh, they have a different style, and I think some of them, they're little, they have a separate fan control board that that's its only job is to run those fans. Um, so that's, uh, uh, you know, that fan, it, it just, that, again, it, and that takes things a step further. Actually, I'll, I'll, I'll continue with that train of thought. So it's one thing to have just the one board. Now you start talking multiple boards. And if you look at these schematics, you'll see on the two control schematics you have that this is your main board and then each separate other component has their own control modules. So you can troubleshoot the base components, the sensors and things and the, the inputs, outputs on the, you know, the start stop stuff from the automation. All that gets troubleshot from the main baseboard. But if you're having EXV problems, if you're having condenser fans not running properly, right? That comes right back to the fan board. And this system runs via communication. Like it literally, there's no, they, they, they talk to each other via, just like a computer would. The manufacturer has their own type of language that they use to communicate from different control boards and uh, you know, there are some times where those communication buses fail. And now you're trying to troubleshoot, is this board actually bad or do I have a communication problem? You know, and I'm guilty of it myself. I've replaced control boards thinking that they weren't outputting because, well, I, I'm, I'm calling on the main controller here. The interface says I'm doing, you know, X. And I come over here to that board that's supposed to be that output relay for X but it's not outputting. Okay, well that board over here is bad. We'll, 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 we'll go change it out. A thousand dollars later, oh crap, it's doing the same thing. That's weird. Yeah. You know, in many of those cases, it turned out to be, uh, actually one, one case <laughs> uh, was just a complete oversight. The controls transformer that fed that board failed. And it lost 24 volts to feed that control module well, just completely spaced, didn't even check, and it, that's all it was. It was just a simple transformer I keep on the truck. Put the new transformer in, that $1,000 board was never needed. And it just, it happens that fast. You know, and those are the lessons that you hopefully won't have to learn if you really try to apply some of these things and, and, and adjust your mind to this, this new concept of how we're gonna troubleshoot this stuff. Does that make sense? Okay. Um, yes. Yes. Yeah, you want a prime example of that. Uh, one, a lot of our automation systems will have a lot of, of DC control, but the um, uh, an SCR heater is, I think, is a prime example. That's something that we run into frequently that still gives everybody a lot of trouble, and we can cover that in detail here, uh, you know, and, and, and kind of discuss that and what's happening there. But you know. Those are DC input controllers. And so uh, that's another tool right there next to the Zebra is signal generators. You know, being able to output a set voltage of your choice to verify. And I'll give you a prime example. I mean, where things, something I've run into is again, so we'll keep it simple, transducers. All right, I said that's, a, that's an input device. So the transducer is reading a pressure and converting that pressure uh, via a little micro control board built into it, as, as small as it is, into a DC output. 
going back to the main controls. All right, so most transducers run a one to five volt signal output. And, and they could either be 24 volts AC in, they could be 24 volts DC in, they could be 12 volts DC in, they could be five volts DC in. And if I remember correctly, I think this panel uh, runs five volts output to, to give power to the transducer, which will then send a one to five uh, volt signal back to represent a pressure. Right? Now, you can walk up to a unit and say you don't have, which honestly, the vast majority of the time we don't. We don't have a, a conversion chart. So you walk up to a unit and uh, you want to see, is, is tripping a pressure safety? And you're trying to verify, is this transducer working properly? Well, you put a gauge on it and you compare it to what the display says the, the uh, transducer is actually reading. And yeah, they, they read different than each other. But you have a really important question to ask yourself now. Is the transducer, or is the transducer actually working and the control board's not? You know, my go-to a lot of times is I'll, without thinking about it, I'll jump to, okay, well, that's, that, that sensor's bad. And I've, I've been wrong before. And it actually had nothing to do with the sensor. Now, you got two options at that point. This is where a signal generator could come in handy, is if you wanted to verify is the control board actually working properly, you yourself can uh, wire in series, or not in series, you would, you would unwire from the transducer's uh, output wire, which a lot of times will be white. So you'll, you'll typically have like a red, a white, and a black going to the transducer. That white wire is almost always going to be your uh, transducer output, which I don't know. Okay, so this um, carrier is actually using a green wire. So they have a red, green, and black. So the, the green is your, uh, is your output wire going into an input on the control board. Uh, you could uh, separate that wire, hook your generator to that green wire, and give it a, a simulated signal, and even just see, will it even vary? Does it even modulate whenever you adjust the pressure or just adjust the input signal? Um, now, you have to be careful because, like I said, almost all of them are a 1 to 5. You put 10 volts DC on that module, you can guarantee you just blew it up. Like it's, it's not going to handle that. So you have to be very, very careful. But um, yeah, you put that signal generator on there and you start varying the, the signal coming in and nothing changes. Very likely that control board's got a problem, right? Those are troubleshooting steps that are, this is, you're gonna use, we have RTUs out there right now that we service r routinely. This is how they operate. This is how we would have to troubleshoot it if we ever needed to go that deep. Like I said, those carrier RTUs are, are prime examples. Uh, and Intellipax are right there behind them. Actually, I'm trying to think, the new Intellipax, I believe they run transducers, I think, right? Same one. No? Not one. You have, uh, down the road here. Okay, yeah, no. Those don't have transducers? No. You don't remember? No. <coughs> I'm trying to remember, I think, the, I thought those did, they may not. Anyway, um, but those are extremely common systems we see on the, all the time. Uh, we'll use Daikin RTUs as another example. Daikin RTUs are very uh, controls dependent, right? On their, on their own onboard controls. You know, you see that with the Microtech 3 controllers. This is right up this, what we're talking about here. And so, uh, you know, yeah, you, you do have to ask the question. Don't just assume transducer is bad sensor because it, it may not be. That makes sense what I'm talking about, the, the signal generator, and um, you can buy some cheaper ones on Amazon, and they'll work. Uh, I do recommend getting a battery-powered one. Do not purchase one that is, does not have its own internal battery. Just don't. Um, but you can find some cheaper ones out there. I do recommend you, you're going to spend probably $100, $200-something for a decent one. 
you can find some inexpensive ones that may or may not hold up for less than $100 online. And this is where we're going to talk symbols a little bit. The symbols to a component, depending on the manufacturer, could be two different things. So a, a device like a transducer could be one of two. It could be just a, a circle, right, a lot of times, and there'll just be three uh, wires taken off out of it. Or you could have a, a more proper um, uh, symbol, that, which is what these schematics have, where uh, you have your input, and then you have your uh, logic. So these, these little lines here represents the solid state logic inside of that sensor. You've got your common, and then you have your um, uh, you have your output, all right? This, this is a proper symbol for something like a pressure sensor, something that's it's a digital pressure sensor, right? Uh, and like I said, this will be your um, power. This will be your common. And then here will be your output. So the same thing up here. They're doing the same thing, it's just instead of making it fancy, they're just putting a circle. You know, then thermistors. Thermistors are the same way. Thermistor could be something as simple as a circle and two wires, or it might actually be a proper thermistor where it's coming in and then they're coming out. So it just, it really, it really depends. Now most of your thermistors are not uh, directional, so they're quite literally just, uh, it, they're just ohms, that's all there is. They're, they're a variable ohm device that's responsive to temperature. And we can graph that response to, meet, to make that, that ohm mean something, you know, being a temperature, right? So for an example, um, Carrier is using a 5K at 77 degree thermistors, all right? What that means is that at 77 degrees, uh, that the thermistors on this panel are going to read 5,000 ohms, give or take, you know, a couple of percent. But whenever it actually applied to practice, the uh, the lower the value, the lower the temperature. Yes. So at um, you know at, at say you get down to say th between 30 and 40 degrees. That 5,000 turns into, um, you know, more like 3,000. And then say you go, you know, over 100 degrees, that quickly turns into tens of thousands. So at, you know, close to 200 degrees, you may be pushing, you know, 30, 40, 50,000 ohms. What's critical there, uh, Real simple ways of, of checking these is say, say you have a, a suction line thermistor. So you got a thermistor on the pipe is reading suction temperature. Just take a, your clamp that you already know is calibrated and just put it right there next to it and then compare. Most all your thermistors across the board and, and the standard the industry uses is you want to be within about two degrees. If you exceed two degrees uh, variance, plus or minus, from that thermistor is likely bad and needs to be replaced. Because what will happen on, on components like these is as they begin to fail, they fail at an exponential rate. So once they start to show early signs of wear, it may have taken it five years to get there, but it's going to take it three months to go the rest of the way that it just finally craps out. So um, yeah. Two degrees is the standard. If, if you see it outside of that range, plus or minus, recommend replacement. Um, yeah. Transducers are, are, again, they're pretty straightforward in the fact of put your gauge on it and compare. You should be within a, a few PSI. You know, if, if you've got especially more than five, but in many cases I'd rather be lower than that. I'd, I would rather be within a couple of PSI 
with a calibrated gauge. Now, a asterisk I'm going to put on that is be very careful if you're using um, a regular compound gauge or analog gauge because you've got to make sure that's calibrated. All right? Eric brings up a good point in his reaction time as well and how quickly they adjust. Yep. No, that's true. Um, yeah, these, these are tests that you really want to do when the system is off and stabilized. And that is a very general test you can do. Like if you walk up to a unit and you have the ability to shut that, the unit down for uh, you know, at least 20, 30 minutes, most all of your uh, sensors should stabilize and align with each other in that time frame. So if you have a bunch of sensors on, at the condenser on the, or the outside portion of the system, they should all be just about or right there at ambient condition. And so that's one quick, you know, not precise, but a very quick, just general test you could do is just walk up and navigate to it and see, you know, what those sensors are reading. And if there's one that's significantly out compared to the others. Now, if your indoor fan's still running, keep in mind, those are probably going to read a different temperature if they're in the airstream or in some other space. So don't let that trip you either. Um, further to that point, be careful of reaction time. So if the system is running and you are trying to check calibration with it online, uh, I guarantee you most of, the, most of the time this control board is going to sense that change long before your sensor does because they're, they're very precise and fine-tuned. So you have to keep that into account. You will mis you'll misdiagnose something really quick that way. Uh, yeah, these are the two most common. Like I said, if you're checking transducer and it, it's within a cu couple of PSI, you're going to be fine. You know, uh, it's, it's good. It's doing what it's supposed to. Roll on. Um, Mm -hmm. Does the remister have to check that? If you're getting resistance on it, mm -hmm. or the system's off, does that mean it's bad? No, you should always have resistance. And you, you've got to check that with it unplugged. Yeah. Yeah. And if you're going to test a transducer, you, you just, you have to treat it like any component. Do you have power in? Yes or no? Say it's a, tw a 24 volt transducer, okay? Do I have 24 volts between this red wire and this black wire? Yes? Okay, then I have power. Do I have output? If I've got, you know, one volt or less, but yet I've got, you know, we'll say 410A, for example, so it's a 410A circuit, I've got four or 500 PSI, but I've only got one volt output, something's wrong. This transducer ain't, it's not responding. All right? Um, and those are linear scales, meaning that, you know, the lower number is, is going to be your lower pressure, higher number is going to be your higher pressure. Uh, do, do, do. Make sense? To check your output, you're going to go DC volts here between the output wire and the common. And then again, it does depend. Is this AC or DC? It could be either or. But depending on what type of voltage it is, you would check that across these two points. So um, it's going to be hard to check this at the transducer. You're really better off finding where that's at on the controller here and troubleshooting it here. So for example, these two, I'm pretty confident. No, I'm sorry. These down here. These were my transducers. And that's funny. You know what? I'm sitting here looking at that. It's a J7. Yeah, those are my J7s. It says green on the schematic, but they're actually white in reality. Yeah, be careful with that. Don't trust the color. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so you would literally, this is where a set of needle 
test pins becomes critical. So if, if all you have are the regular, just uh, a, a regular uh, test pin for your meter, another thing you're going to need to invest in is a set of needle tips to add to that. Because you're not going to fit, without potentially breaking something, a regular uh, pins in here. So you really want to get those needle point pins. Uh, fill piece is, is one I could highly recommend. They have an excellent set. Uh, the little, little black long needle points and they, they've got insulated, right? Highly recommend those. Anyway, you would use that here. So let's just pull this off. Uh, you would test DC volts between the white and the black and then you would do, say, as an example, it's 24 volts AC. You'd switch over to 24 volts AC and read between the red and the black to see, one, are you getting power? And then is it outputting the DC signal? How do I establish what voltage is using? Uh, in, in some cases, <laughs> it varies. Yes. My recommendation there. And this, sometimes it might tell you. This schematic does not. You can also go to the trans. Huh? In my experience, it has never. Okay. Well, except when it's 24. So. Well, it, in some, in, in some cases, you can go to the transducer and it might have a voltage rating on it, right? Uh, now, whether it's faded or covered in oil is a different ex story. Um, now, another suggestion I would have is if the other transducers appear to be working and it's isolated to that one, yeah, use them as examples. Test between all of them. Are all of them outputting the same voltage? That's a, that's a, that's a real metric you can use. And, and again, for thermistors, so those on this particular board look like this. And actually, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk about these a little heavier. This is a pretty common thermistor type plug. Um, and I'll tell you something the factory did. I caught the other day. Anyway, uh, yeah, you've got to make sure you unplug this. Don't test this with it on the board because that board will affect your reading and you will not get whatever it is accurately. Okay, just keep that in mind. Now, uh, story time. Had an RTU carrier, go figure. I love carrier, by the way. If you, if you don't get the undertone here, uh, carrier is my favorite manufacturer. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, Train uses this same setup on their thermistors, the exact same thing. And there is a special tool. So if you look in here, and I think I've got, yeah, I can pass, I uh, get it out of here. Pass this around. Uh, you can kind of get a visual example. For those online, I don't know if this is focused, but this, how about that? Better? So those are your little test pins. This is the connector that it's going to be doing. You can pass that around. Everybody can look at it. Now, there is a special tool. I don't know the name of it. You can buy them through Train. I think Train sells them. They are specifically made to push these wires in. These wires are intended, you, you're not, you're not going to take a sensor in this uh, adapter be on there. Okay? This sensor pulls straight out. This is meant to be reusable. Okay? That's the plug-in side, correct to the board. Mm -hmm. Yes. So when you buy that thermistor, it's just going to be a thermistor with a long wire, and you've got to manually make this connection in the field. It will not. Now, it may come with a spare one, pretty rare, but you might by chance just happen to have one of these in the bag. It won't be already on there, though. You're still going to have to put it on. Okay? Now, in this, my suggestion is if you don't have the tool to push that down into those blades, because what these blades do is you're not going to strip this. All right, let, me, let me make that clear now. You're not going to strip these wires. If you did, you did it wrong, take it out, cut that strip part out, 
and you're going to reinstall it with the installation on there. Now, um, my recommendation is if you don't have the tool, you can take a broad head, uh, a flat head is what I recommend, not the big jumbo ones, but like a regular electrical flat head, but try to get one with a broader tip on it, not so narrow and knife-like, because the goal is not to cut the insulation, because what happens is that insulation actually helps grab those teeth and hold the wire steady in place. So without the insulation, the wire, it makes it very easy for it to jiggle around and make a very poor connection. And what I found was this was, a, they've been installed recently in the last couple of years, and they had always had issues with this particular RTU uh, not reading uh, one of the temperatures on the, uh, on, the, the, on the RTU from the automation. Now, it, it, was a, it was a thermistor that was inconsequential. It did not have an impact on operation. But the customer was not okay with the fact that it read 30 degrees when in reality it was more like 55. The problem wasn't the thermistor. What they did, and this, this came like this from the factory, they took the wire and bent it, inserted it down into the middle, and then pushed it down. They also stripped it, by the way. So they stripped it, stuck it in the middle, and shoved it in. That is wrong on every possible way it could be. The proper way to do this is if you bend it at all, you're going to put just a tiny little crimp on the end, and it's just enough to hook into that little opening there on its own. Okay? And then you're going to take that flathead and put it up against something and try not to stab yourself and gently slide it in there. And you want that seated so that those, those knives actually cut through that insulation and make solid contact, and it's got a solid connection. You saw what it took for me to pull this apart. That's how yours should be. It should be solid. It should not come apart easily. If it does, take it apart, do it again. So, yeah, IOs, welcome to your new reality. <laughs> um, so like I said, so you can test this uh, with, with this already in there and those wires. You've got enough of those metal knives. You can take your regular uh, your regular leads and just hit those metal terminals and you can get enough connection to read resistance. Now, if you have the needle leads, it's even easier because you can slide those needle leads into those uh, pin points and, and get, the, and get a, a easier reading. If you haven't done it before, trying to hold the regular leads and hold your fingers and, you know, kind of look funny doesn't work so well. It's kind of a pain in the butt, but you take them needle leads, you can just slide them in there, and you've got your reading. Any questions on that? Those that have little, little metal pieces in there make it a lot easier to read it. And if you take your needle leads and really jam them in there real hard, they'll bend. <laughs> <laughs> From experience, I take it. Yeah, they're, they're, they're really, they're really flexible. <laughs> really flexible. <laughs> oh, that's funny. There's some Aeon RTUs that I've seen that have stuff like that jumping around through all the mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah, th those are intended to be reused. Uh, and believe me, I didn't get prior training on that, so the first time I ever saw one was on a chiller, and uh, I was genuinely confused. So don't feel bad. Just take my experience. <laughs> this plug here, for those who can see, this is your communication line. This is your comm bus, by the way. So this one little plug here that plugs into that green port, this is where all your communication goes through between the boards. Mm -hmm. And it's going to be jumpered board to board, so here's your comm for this board, which then jumpers over to uh, this board, and this brown and, and uh, red should be the communication terminal there. Actually, hang on, let me pause. Let me make sure I'm not telling you wrong. These things trip me up. 
<laughs> yeah, but I'd rather tell you the right than the wrong. No, that's power. I'm sorry. Okay. Enough. I gotta see what you're doing. This this red and brown in here, not that you can actually see this. Anyway, I, I'm sorry, that was power. Your actual comm is over here. So it, the, the point is, that is the comm network that all these boards tie to and communicate through. Okay? Um, something else I'll point out is the vast majority of the time, not always, these displays are just strictly a display. They do not control, house, or have any kind of parameters in them. So when they fail, it's just a chunk of plastic. There's nothing else there to have to worry about. It's literally a plug and play. Okay? Um, <laughs> huh? That was a plug and play joke. Uh -oh. <laughs> By the way, if you do have a navigator for a carrier, if we're talking carrier specifically, this is where that navigator would plug in. Okay? And you specifically are going to use the LEN, L-E-N, network connection for that navigator. Does everybody know what I'm even talking about? And that's a special little computer, right? That's got, you got to plug in. And Not even a computer. It's, it's, module. it's just a module display. Hmm? Yes. It'll, it'll be called, it's, yeah, Comfort Leak Navigator. So it's labeled on there. You ever, get your, your, you ever get a chance to get your hands on one, don't pass it up. I don't mean steal one from an RTU that has one that's working. I mean, you ever take an RTU or a chiller out? That's how I got mine. The one that I, I, I have, my personal one, we demoed an, or an, a chiller that had one in it. I used it. You know, I, you know it was what going to the scrapyard. Similar units on a roof, they both have one. Would it be okay to take one in that case? I know we're building Negative. <laughs> that was still considered ceiling. Anyway, yes, those navigators are extremely handy tools, and that one navigator module will work across the board with any uh, comfort link communication system. Just a little side note there, getting real specific with Carrier. So just, just bear that in mind. Uh, you, you can take one off of a chiller and go over to an RTU, plug it in, and you will get the same function and operation. It's not going to matter. OK, actuators. Since they tend to be a bit of a struggle, then we'll kind of touch on SCRs a little bit. You're at 630, by the way, if you're wondering about time. OK, thank you. We good here? But can I? All right, yeah, all right. Any questions before I transition gears here so far? Seems like we're tracking pretty good. All right, I'm going to move on. So again, uh, transducers, the, all of these that we've been talking about are considered input devices. So an actuator would be considered an output device. Uh, a, a real example of where we'll see a, an actuator on a standard mechanical system that is not automation controlled is we'll use in, uh, self contains. You know, a lot of self contains, not all, and most of them that do have them are usually disabled, but they do have a factory um, uh, uh, control valve on the water. Does anybody have any idea what that valve is for? Low pressure damper. Hmm? Head pressure. No. It's head pressure control. Yeah, it's, it's head pressure control. Now, a, a warning I'm going to give you is this kind of small rabbit hole here, but if you're ever working on one of those and you walk up to it, and, and this is the reason why a lot of them are disabled, by the way, the actuators. Circuit one's down, but you have low pressures and, and, uh, you, on your circuit two and three, and they're trying to run. The transducer that controls that actuator for head pressure control is on circuit one on the liquid line. Train and McQuay do it this way. So if circuit one is down, that actuator, if, if the circuit doesn't have any pressure on it, uh, that actuator will, uh, psych, will, will, will close down because it doesn't think there's any head pressure. Right? If it thinks the circuit is running. Okay. If it knows 
and this, this happens, if it knows circuit 1 isn't running and it won't come on, um, and I, uh, it, it will automatically open that valve all the way. And I need to make a correction. I think I said if you see low head pressure, I meant to say if you see high head pressure. That's what I meant to say. So if you walk up and you see a lot of high head pressure and you realize you've got a water flow issue, you need to make sure that the unit knows circuit one is not online and it doesn't have low head pressure. Okay? Because that's what's telling that control system that it's not working, which, which is, I mean, that happens. Uh, the high pressure doesn't trip, the low pressure doesn't trip, and it, it, the, um, let's say that the, the winding uh, uh, opens internally and the compressor turns off, head pressure takes a nosedive. As far as the controls are concerned, circuit one's running just fine because none of the safeties have tripped. But as soon as it sees that nosedive on the head pressure, it's going to start pinching that valve down because it thinks there's a problem. And then circuit two, three, and four are going to start tripping high pressures. And you're going to walk up confused as heck. Right? That's a real scenario that that transducer will get you in trouble. And that actuator. That actuator is a analog controlled actuator. Okay, so analog means it's a variable point. Digital or binary is off and on. All right, so when you start talking IOs, this is the terminology we got to use. We won't get into triax and none of that, don't worry. I'll leave where we can. How do you establish that about the, that situation? Because I think that the, the troubleshooting electronics, then it's important to know that how do you come across that? Because it's not immediately obvious to anybody here that we how to find that. Mm -hmm. I think that's why we're here, so I don't know how to put it up. Okay, so we'll take this example. You walk up to a RTU that's got a bunch of uh, high head pressure alarms. Okay, you reset the alarms, you put a gauge on it, and you watch them. Every circuit starts tripping back out on high head pressure. What's, the, what's one of the first things you're going to check? What flow? No, we're talking air-cooled. Oh, air-flow? Okay, yeah, you're going to check fans, you're going to check coils. In the same exact process, we got to look at the water. You walk up and consecutively everything's tripping high head pressure. It's not just one, it's all, or multiple. The first place we should start going to is that water flow. Do we have flow? Is the strainer plugged? Is that valve open? Did somebody close something off? Is the pump got an issue? Right? Because that's, that's just, it's the same exact mindset, except it's water instead of air. So that's going to lead you is you're going to go through all this, the troubleshooting steps on the water, and you're going to identify that mechanically the water is fine. You know, you know the strainer, everything looks fine. Now what you might notice is that your deferential pressure doesn't look quite right. Maybe, if it even has gauges on the pipe. So, heck, a lot of times they don't. So, mechanically, everything looks sound. So, then you gotta start diving deeper. And then you, you should, at that point, come across the actuator and whether or not it is installed and whether or not it's working, whether or not it's open or closed. And if you do find that, you should immediately start looking at that transducer. Now, those units do have a function where if that transducer fails, it should trip an alarm and ignore it. And in this situation, we're, we already know that we have a transducer that's an input to the board that mm -hmm. can control the actuator. Yeah, you walk up to that unit and you pull that first panel off and you look down at that liquid line uh, and you see a transducer sitting there, you already know that you've very likely got a control valve on the water. That's the only thing that transducer's purpose is. Hmm? And Daikin, the new Daikin SWP uh, self-contains have a similar setup, just more updated. So the, the, the new trains, the new trains have a similar setup. And trains will take it a step further. They not, they not only do head pressure control, they're, they, a lot of them might have a water side economizer, which is a whole other rabbit trail we're not going to get into in this. But just be in mind, you might see two valves there. If you see two valves uh, in actuators, you're likely looking at a system that has economized capacity. 
meaning it will turn off the uh, mechanical cooling and, this, and use the cooling tower to turn into the building cooler and chill the condenser water loop down and process it through a water coil on the back side of the unit which is what you're actually looking at when you pull the filters, not the refrigerant coil. And now it starts using condenser water to, to maintain building load. Whole another rabbit trail. Uh, I do cover that in the last class we did when we talked about uh, freeze protection and economizers. I cover that in that class. So if you didn't get to see it and you're curious about it, go back and watch that. I do have it posted. Actuators. Outputs. Uh, an actuator could be represented, most of the time it's just, it's, it's a square, it's a circle, it's a, just some random shape. They, they don't, I don't think they even have their own legitimate uh, signal, like a uh, symbol. They're just, a, they're a generic component symbol, much like a coil would be, right? So your regular coil, there's your symbol for a coil. Well, it's kind of the same thing for an actuator that I'm aware of. So anyway. Uh, your actuators are going to have three wires coming out of them. This is where you got to get careful because there are two types now. You have floating point or you have analog input or di digital actuators as they're also called. Okay? So <clears throat> we'll start with a, I'm writing this really small for everybody online. You're welcome. We will start with a, uh, I think the simplest is a digital, but it's probably not the one we run into the most. Uh, and another example of this, you, you're going to commonly see this on VAVs and fan power boxes. And uh, yeah, those are probably the most common. Anyway, um, digital, there we go. You'll have a power. The vast majority of the time, these are going to be a 24 volt. They could be 120 if you're talking like a, a water valve, might be a 120 input. They're usually going to be 24. We actually had a couple of automation guys here. Water valve, something like that. You typically see a 120, 24. What do you see? 24? Okay. Fire damper sometimes. There you go. Fire damper is 120. Got it. Yeah. Well, yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah. So anyway, the 120s do exist, not the standard. You'll also have your, um, you'll have your digital, or I'm sorry, your analog input. So this will be your uh, input. I swear I'm not having a stroke. And you have your common. Okay. Power's got to be there. Your input signal's got to be there. And you're common. What y'all laughing at? Okay. <laughs> uh, this is this is another prime example. Probably the most the most prime example next to SCRs, where that signal generator is going to be your best friend. Okay, is when you have a uh, a digital, and, and digital meaning you have a DC input, not digital as in a binary. Okay, not an off and on. So keep that in mind. Uh, but you have you have a uh, yeah, a, a digital actuator, okay? This input could be a range of things. This could be um, uh, 0 to 10, could be what, 0 to 5, could be uh, 2 to 10. Uh, we could be 4 to 20 milliamps. Uh, the vast majority of the time, 0 to 10, most standard common. Those others, not so much. Anyway, this is what's going to be inputted, and you can read that between, just like you would do a transducer, right? So when I, I made that comparison early on, this is the same basic concept, except we have an input power or input signal instead of an output signal. So it's being told to do something instead of telling what something is. Okay? Same basic troubleshooting process. So if we're getting uh, 10 volts DC, but we've got 
50% position, then it's very, something's likely wrong. Because it should know that it's in a 50% position and it should be either open or closed. And I do mean open or closed. Okay, this is where we start talking reverse and direct acting. All right, so we're direct acting, 10 volts DC, 100% open. Reverse acting, 10 volts DC, fully closed. And that's actually a lot of your, um, if you ever replace these, a lot of your actuators, especially the Belimos, will have a little uh, black plastic uh, turn on them. You flip that one way, it's going to respond as a direct acting actuator. You flip it the other, you just converted it to reverse acting. You've got to make sure that's set correctly whenever you do that change up or install or whatever the heck it is you're doing. So these are the little electronic just things we've got to pay attention to. And it's going to tell us what to measure again? Nope. And so we just got to guess. And the problem here is, is if it's 24 volts and it's, and it's uh, because you can have 24 volts, it's on and off. And you can have 20, uh, you know, so it's like. OK, the on off. But we're going to pause there for a sec. That's floating. floating. We'll get to that next. OK. And, and, but I mean, like, if I see a voltage of two, two volts, the A signal. Do I just sit there and run through my meter? And, and so I, I, because that seems to look very shot in the dark. I, how do I know the DC from AC? How do I know the milliamps to DC? You know? Because you're going to get milliamps on a some mm -hmm. of the last circuit, and you put so, it, so if I measure milliamps, and I go like, dang, mm -hmm. I get, how do I know it wasn't DC? How do I determine which one I'm looking at? So part of what he's saying, you know, as to knowing which input it is, that, so that's the question for everybody, if you didn't hear, is, is ultimately, how do you know what the input is if, if, you, if you don't okay. just know? Um, a lot of your older actuators had dip switches you had to set what the input would be. Correct me if I'm wrong, automation guys, I'll, I'll look to you all for some input here, but most of your modern ones, especially like Belimo, will be auto uh, sensing. Like they'll, they'll sense automatically which, which is which. Now, something I will tell you is that if it is uh, a milliamp, correct me if I'm wrong, but when you read across a milliamp signal, you're gonna show 24 DC? Is that right? Okay, I, I, th I think if something in my mind is telling me that that, that is uh, that is the case. Like a, a, you're going to see a, like a DC volts of 24 across that input and common terminal. Right. So that would be one way to indicate it. Um, when it comes to diving deeper than that, genuinely, I'm not sure. Okay. Like it's, it's really the standard and the, the I'm going to say over 90% of the time is going to be a 0 to 10 especially on modern systems, okay? So you can use that, you can walk in. I typically walk in with the assumption of a zero to 10, but if I, re if I start to see things that would indicate to me otherwise, then I start adjusting my, my thought process to that. Before I continue with this, I do want to backtrack real quick. Uh, the schematic that, was, uh, that had the little four control boards up top, if you come back to that, uh, we actually did locate, it. there was a high pressure safety, not low, we could, there was not low pressure, but there was a high pressure safety switch on this chiller. And if you go to that page on JP3, that was your high pressure safety. And you see it's just a single, single input device. There's nothing else in series, it doesn't run through anything. It, it's, it, that, that's a classic example of just a single input safety. Okay, so just give you a visual. This is what I'm referencing. And these boards they got here are just generic boards, and so they're it's like a parts bin thing with input output. And would there have to be some sort of logic internal to that board? Uh, yes, that board is is communicating 
Um, so you see on, on uh, JP2, JP2 is your input COM bus, okay? And that goes over to JP1 on the other board beside it. That JP1 is passing COM through its own JP2, which goes back, you'll see it there at the bottom, two main base board. That are these plugs here. So, uh, you know, these are the, all these plugs are the red, white, and black. These are those COM buses that pass through to the other boards. Coming back to the, um, the actuator. So we were talking about, uh, we left off with trying to identify input output. Yes. Okay. Uh, so like I said, good assumption. You know, you'll be right most of the time if it is a, uh, if it is a digital. Now, some symbols that will tell you this will have a sine wave. This will be, usually it'll either be a C or it may be a ground symbol. Okay, it could be either or. And this would typically be a T. Okay, that sound right? Double checking with y'all, y'all see this more than I do? Yep, okay. Um, that T symbol, now that T may be turned on its side, it may not be a legit T. Uh, it's not representing a T, it just, it looks like one, right? It's, it, that is, your, that's, that, that's an immediate indicator that you have a analog input, you know, DC input uh, actuator versus a floating point. Okay, so your floating point will still have the same three wires, but the terminals will be, say, uh, you'll, have, you'll have two things, either a squiggly arrow or a CCW, then you'll have uh, it could be a ground symbol. I think most of the time they may just say like calm, if they say anything at all. I've also seen them where they don't, the middle, the middle terminal is what it's going to be. It, uh, it won't have any indication. And then the other one will have a little swirly circle the other way, or it may say CW. All right. Counterclockwise, clockwise. That's what it's indicating to you. That's what the little squiggly circle means, too. <laughs> what? <Sorry. laughs> There's no way it's called squiggly circle. <laughs> 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 well, what's it called? Come on. Yeah, no. Every time I see one now, I'm going to be like, look. It's the squiggly circle. What this is going to be is these actuators are done through time, okay? So this one, you know, f f say it's a 0 to 10, 5 volts is 50%, okay? This could be a 30 second, could be 60, could be 90, 120, 180, keep going. What this is going to mean, and it will be labeled on there, uh, is how long it takes for that actuator to go from one position and all the way to the other. And, and you know, that travel time is the actuator's time sequence. And that's where the counterclockwise and the clockwise come into play, is the control circuit has it built in that it's going to feed 24 volts for, let's say it's a 30 second, for 15 seconds to the counterclockwise to get to the midpoint. And it's going to kill that 24 volts. And then it decides, okay, I, don't, I no longer need that actuator open, then I'm going to feed another 24 volts to the, to the clockwise, and I'm going to, for 15 seconds, and I'm going to drive it all the way back where, the way it came from. 
or it could feed another 24 volts to open it even more on the counterclockwise or close it or whatever direction it is, right? So that's what these signals are. So what you will see is you'll see the 24 volts, just it, it will, it'll come and go. Uh, so you'll see it and then you won't. And when is, there's no voltage there, it's just going to be in a locked position by the gears. The gears on that actuator are, in, they will lock that shaft in place to where it won't rotate without voltage. Same thing will happen on these, by the way. You turn that 24 off, it's going to lock in. It's very common for these to get out of sync. So if that uh, system controller either hasn't done a sync in a while or it hasn't, um, uh, it hadn't had a power cycle in some time, it may, it, it may think, you know, 100% open uh, is, uh, you know, it, it may only be 60%. And it's because that time sequence has gotten out of sync with itself and it doesn't actually know its real position. And so usually mo most of these systems, when you cycle power, it will do an automatic calibration at power up. Not always, but the vast majority will. If you don't have that ability and you do have the ability to send an override signal to the controller to say you want to tell it, tell it to go 100%, okay? The valve may not actually drive 100% open, but then you can hit the clutch and manually set it to 100% and you're now calibrated. That makes sense? Okay, it's, it's really that simple. And if we're troubleshooting this, it's, it's again, it's as simple as these, these are a lot easier because technically, now you're gonna unplug from the controller to do this, you could manually jumper 24 volt feeds to either of these from the system controls, you know, the, the, the control transformer, and drive that actuator yourself. And you're not gonna hurt it. You could leave 24 volts on it that way and it's just, it's just gonna go. It's not gonna hurt having it driven. So um, that's, the, that's a way of troubleshooting it. But keep in mind, you ever walk up and you're trying to troubleshoot this thing and you hit that clutch and turn it? If it was synced, it ain't no more. And you have no idea what that controller is now trying to tell it to do. You're gonna have to do something to sync it again so that it will find its realignment. Keep that in mind. A analog input actuator doesn't require that. It knows its position. It, it has an internal circuit board that's tracking what position it is in internally. So it knows 50% is 50%. So what you could do is if you had five volts DC on here and you took the 24 volts off, Heck, you, well, yeah, you pull that 24 volts, clutch it, drive it, it knows you moved it. Even if you left the 24 volts on there and you clutch it and drive it, it knows it moved. It's going to drive right back to that 50% point. But again, there's logic inside of this thing. If you ever open one of these up, there's nothing. They've got a little bit, they might have a miniature board in there that is nothing more than a surge protector. And that's it. These, these two points, there are these three terminals, go straight to the motors. And there'll be two motors on the gear shaft. One will be a clockwise motor, one will be a, a counterclockwise, and they'll be stacked on top of each other. It's literally that simple. We will move into some SCR troubleshooting. Who does not know what an SCR is to begin with? Awesome. That's all right. No shame in that. None at all. Uh, the same conversation I had about us transitioning from series-based systems to IOs, I could basically just rinse and repeat with a SCR conversation. 
okay? Old electric heat systems, you just, you had a set of contacts. You want stage one heat, you close the relay, you fire that set of contacts, okay? Heater's on. When the temperature satisfies, you drop out the contacts. Pretty simple. SCRs, on the other hand, which stands for silicone controlled rectifier, or silicon controlled rectifier. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a solid state relay is what it is. It's basically a really big triac almost, which if you, if you don't know what that is, I won't, I'm not going to dive deep into that, but I have done a full training video on triacs and explain in detail what they are and how they test and function. I did it, I don't know, it's, it's been over a year, so you, you'd have to look back. But it is there. It's in my training library if you want to reference back to it. Anyway, um, its job, inevitably, its main function, and it all goes right back to efficiency and control, is to modulate how much heat the heater sends out. Okay? So what used to be just a flat 5K heater or heat strip is no longer. It is a 0.3, 0.5K, 2, 5K heater because of the SCR. And quite literally, what we're doing is we're modulating the control output voltage to, uh, in, in the same uh, pulse width pattern you'd have with a VFD. Okay, so we've done some VFD classes, but, um, you know, if you don't know, uh, what I mean by a pulse width is you'll have a no signal on pulse, no signal on pulse, and let's say this is a, we're talking, you know, in some cases fractions of a second, okay? But then this was a, we'll say this, this pattern, okay, is a 1K output on the heater. But then let's say we want to bump that up to a 5K output. If you were to put an oscilloscope on it, you would start to see something more like that. This is leaving the heater. This is not control voltage going to the heater. This is what is leaving that heater. Okay? And if you put a clamp on it, and it's running, say, 1K, your meter is going to freak out. And, this, and it should. That's a good sign. That's a positive troubleshooting sign. When you put that clamp on there, and that meter is going crazy, and you read across your input signal, which we'll get to in a second, and you're, you're seeing, say, 2 volts DC coming to it, that's good. It's doing exactly what it's supposed to do. And the goal of this is so that it, we don't have the constant start-stop, all right? We can really fine-tune, and this goes back to, you know, some form of automation control, or even these RTUs are going to have this type of technology going forward where the RTU controller is controlling SCR heaters for their reheat or whatever the heck it is that they're using it for. Um, uh, and... Uh, ooh, really lost my train of thought there. <sighs> That's right. It's so that we can really f fine tune that. So if, if we need to stabilize a space temperature, we only need 1.5K worth of heat, that heater through the control system will slowly tune that output signal, if you were to graph the temperature, it would look something like this. This would be the space temp. If this kind of feels like an automation class, it's because this is what I'm talking about. We're, we're becoming so close to, we're doing the same things now at the unit level. We don't have an automation system doing this. Okay? Now the automation systems obviously do. Anyway, 
your space temperature, instead of having these dramatic upswings and downswings, which this right here is what a off on 5K would look like at any given time. Way up, way down, way up, way down. And SCR gets you to here, to where 1.5K is able to maintain a steady temperature at any given load. And the moment the load slightly changes, it may bump that up 1.6. All right, we lock in right there. Okay, we get a little colder. All right, we're going to bump it up 1.7. It's that fine-tuned. So that's what a SCR heater is doing. It'll have a, it'll, and it'll be doing that through a single leg if it's single phase, or it may have, uh, if it's three phase, you'll usually have a, a dual pole SCR, which will be processing two legs through it at one time. Okay, what that looks like. And we are very likely to have some major freeze come very soon, so this is going to be extremely relevant very, very soon. They say into this week, you know, we're likely to drop down pretty heavy. So that SCR heater, uh, we actually, we used to have one out there. I think we got rid of it though. Anyway, you're just going to have, I'm going to switch over. That marker is getting a little tired. Ah, yeah, thank you for the reminder. You're going to have, just, it'll be, be a component, and you'll have L1 and L2, and then you have T1, T2. This will be usually like a little white square looking box, maybe slightly rectangular-ish, and it'll have a green little board sitting on it. And that board will typically have uh, three wires coming off. Okay, this is a three phase. Uh, this is a three phase heater. A single phase will be slightly different. Uh, you will have just, on one end, it'll be L1 and T1. And then you'll have your little control comm module with three wires coming off. Okay. Uh, that's the difference. Now, an immediate indicator and you walk up and you want to know, do you have SCR heat without ever opening a panel? Is does the outside of that panel got a big aluminum fin looking thing sticking out of it? You see that? You have SCR heaters. No question. Okay, so they may be painted. Some of them are painted. It's an aluminum heat sink is what it's referred to as. It's, it's, it's what it is. It's a heat sink to try to draw the heat out of this relay as it's cycling the gates in there so that it doesn't overheat. Depending on the, the, the style and size, they could literally be as, this big old huge metal block sticking out of the panel. There won't be any fan, won't be nothing like that, just a big old metal block. Anyway, um, you're talking hundreds, and in some cases pushing thousands, or a thousand dollars for one of these controllers. So a misdiagnosis is not really seen as, you don't want to do that, okay? You want to make sure, if you're going to condemn one of these, you really need to be correct. You, you, this thing is, you're talking around $500. And you're talking 800 to 1,000 in many cases for this one. And a lot of times, these are not shelf items. These will be special order. Okay? Now, something I'm going to throw in there, there will usually be a interlock contactor uh, typically on the leaving side. So on our T's, right, you'll have an interlock contactor between the relay, the, the SCR, and the actual heat strips. And that'll be a safety. So if your high limit trips on your heater, 
it's going to open that interlock contact. Okay? Uh, that, that is a safety component that needs to be there. So when you open it and you see that, and that's, that interlock contact is not pulling in, you know, it may not be the SCR. So be careful with that. I do have a SCR troubleshooting video that I did. Uh, it's, I, it, heck, it's probably too, close to two years old now. Anyway, you look back, I think it's about five minutes long or so, and I go through a signal generator and everything, how I troubleshooted a, uh, a VAV that had SCR heat control in it. It was providing outside air to a, a mechanical room. So that would be a good reference point. If you want a good visual, you can reference back to. Anyway, obviously, so this is your input powers, your leaving power is going to the heaters. You're gonna have, just, it's the same, same basic setup. You've got your power, uh, your power wires, you've got your signal, and you got your common. Just, and you're gonna troubleshoot this the same way. You know, majority of the time, they're going to be a zero to 10 or maybe a zero to five. Actually, I'll take that back. Zero to 10, zero to five are the two most common I see. Usually, if an automation company actually installed it, then it will be at like a zero to 10. If it is a factory in, uh, controlled device, which is in some cases, um, uh, and if I remember correctly, the service call I ran was actually that way. It was not an automation company that it put the controller in there. It was a, um, uh, it was a factory controller that was receiving input from an automation controller, but the factory controller ran the SCR relay or heater. Uh, or, yeah. Anyway, so... Um, what it did is it had a temperature thermistor in the leaving side of the VAV and that there was a dial to where you could adjust the leaving air temp. And depending on where you set that temp, adjusted how much it tried to control the SCR. So that's a very common setup. You, it, it's a 50-50 shot. A lot of the times those may be, or those will be a zero to five they could also be 0 to 10. And then on a rare occasion, I'm not even sure honestly if actually I have seen one, but on a rare occasion you might run into a 4 to 20 milliamp. So anyway, just things to keep in mind. Again, we go back to the same troubleshooting process. Do you have input power? Usually 24 volts AC. And then do you have signal? So if you've got a signal input, it's going to be linear, meaning lower voltage is less, more voltage is more. If you have that input signal and you don't have output and your interlock is closed, then obviously something's wrong. So these little green control boards are built-in components. It's not something you're going to replace separately. And most of the time what happens with these is they will just over time, they overheat, they wear down. The silicon inside just naturally breaks down from the load and they just go out. Uh, now, what I will tell you is when they get to full power, the little gates that are inside there that create that pulse, uh, the uh, pulse width modulation is the term, PWM. The gates in there that create the pulse, when they lock, when, they, when you get to maximum capacity, they will just lock closed. And that's when you'll see a stable reading. So if you've got a zero to 10 system, you've got five volts DC input, they're saying something's not right with it, it's overheating, whatever, you name it. You walk up and you take an amp reading and it's a stable reading and it's not fluctuating and you can read voltage across it and it's just locked in, Something hap something's wrong because that relay just has, has failed. It's not, pulse it's not modulating the pulses. So that's another indicator that, you know, like, like I said earlier, that, that fluctuation on your meter is a positive thing. It's something you want to see if you're in the middle.
Now, say you've had 10 volts DC in that scenario on your signal. You want to see a stable volt amperage. If you don't, those gates may be getting weak or probably have gotten weak and it's on, the way, it's, on its way to fail. Because like I said, at maximum power, that, that amperage should lock in at max amps, at design amps. That makes sense? Any questions towards that? What's our time? 7.30. Okay. I just barely got it in there. We have not talked towards cube relays and the logic relays. <laughs> uh, trying to... Yeah, I will say this to, to just keep short. The logic relays are exactly what they sound like. They're logic relays. Now, they may be, in some cases, they may be an 8-pin, a 10-pin, a 12-pin. They could even be as low as a 6-pin. They're usually some sort of control device. Without, it's a solid-state control. The most common use we have for it is a time-delay control. Another use can be a lockout control. Okay? So, uh, just... Briefly, you've got a circle, you'll have a little hole in the middle with a key point, so it's only going to go in one way. You've got your various little termination points, okay? Uh, two terminals are going to be your power feeding the logic controller or the logic relay, and then you may have um, these two terminals are reading this safety. And if this safety opens, then this output contact uh, between, yeah, here we go. So this contact that's controlling the, hell, you name it, okay, contactor for the compressor will open if this safety opens. And that, at that point, that becomes an interlock. It could also be to where when this safety closes, it will not close this relay until 60 seconds later. Okay, so that would be where it would function as a time delay device. Every relay, the bases will be the same. The bases are universal. Okay, what's different is the physical relay you buy. And you should be able to take whatever relay model number Look it up on Google, typically, and you can pull up some form of schematic from the manufacturer. A lot of times these will be like blue or black, big old boxes about you know, a couple of inches long, big old square thing. Uh, and they may even have some dials on it where you can fine tune. Uh, you even see them, they use them for three phase uh, interlock controls. It's another example. It could be your, your three phase monitor in some scenarios. Uh, that's that's what your logic relay is. So you need to know what these termination pins mean in order for it to, for you to even begin to troubleshoot it. If you don't have those pin terminations and what they're supposed to be, you're wasting time. You gotta find that first before you even proceed. Understand? That makes sense? It's a very basic, just very basic version of that. Those, anyway, uh, we'll leave it there. <laughs>